Hi, I'm Doug from Dynamic Computing, and welcome to episode 151 of 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast. Now this week, we're going to talk about something that I've done a video on before, and you'll see a video here before about the awesome Pi Storm, and the Pi Storm is fantastic. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, what it is, is it'll, it's an interface that will allow you to use a Raspberry Pi, like a 3A or a 3B, or even now the Raspberry 4, um, and use that as kind of an accelerator for the Amiga. It takes over all of the CPU functions and works incredibly fast taking over the CPU functions, and then allows you to either use the onboard uh, hard drive controller if you have it like an Amiga 1200 or an Amiga 600, or allows you to use the actual Pi, Raspberry Pi, as a hard drive interface. Now, the way this worked on my last video that I just linked to is there would be these little hard drive files and it would kind of emulate an Amiga hard drive, and it was wicked, wicked fast. Uh, it also had some additional features that were available, like the ability to use um, the onboard networking of the Raspberry Pi to network your Amiga, which is really cool. And uh, that is one particular branch of the Pi Storm, and that's a perfectly valid way to go. But today we're going to be talking about the, the MU68K branch of it, which is faster and cooler in some ways and less powerful in others. For example, right now, networking is not enabled on it. But it is wicked fast when it comes to the CPU emulation and for all you people who think, oh, you're just running the Amiga on a Raspberry Pi, no, you're not. No, you're not. You're not at all. It's taking over the CPU functions and pretending it's like a 6840 CPU. Um, you're still using your Paula chip just fine. Paula still sings away. You're still using your ECS or your AGA chipset. No problems at all. Well, <laughs> yeah, problems, but, uh, but it still uses the onboard chipset. Your floppy drive, you want to use your hard drive controller? Fine, all works just great. It takes over the CPU and it can offer really nice retargetable graphics, which we'll be covering today. Now, my Raspberry Pi interface is the Raspberry Pi interface for the Amiga 1200. And this was a gracious gift from my friends at Amiga Kit right here. Uh, Matthew contacted me a couple of weeks ago and asked me if I wanted one for review. Absolutely. But as you guys know, just because somebody sends me a part for free to review does not automatically equal a glowing review. There's been plenty of times I've received free things for review and I've given it a, well, my honest opinion. And if it's got flaws, it's got flaws and I tell you about them. But thank you, Matthew. You're the best. And thanks, Chris, for helping me out with a few dumb little issues that I ran in, into a few weeks ago. I appreciate that. But uh, let's dig into what Amiga Kit provides. So this is the lovely little Pi Storm Lite for the Amiga 1200. Why is it called the Pi Storm Lite? Well, there's a lot of different explanations I can find for it online. Lite makes it sound like it's a limited version and then there's a full version but there isn't, so it's just an interesting name. Now, on, on board here, we have a couple of control chips. Uh, we've got the header for the GPIO header and a nice connector for our Amiga 1200. Now, one would look at this and think, oh, I put the Raspberry Pi right here. Well, nay, nay, you don't do that. You flip the little guy over and you put it on the bottom and that's because of how everything mounts inside. Now this comes with a nice little thermal pad right here that works as a heat sink for your Raspberry Pi. So when you take your Raspberry Pi, now in this case, I'm using a nice Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi Model 3A+. It will also work with a 3B and it does fit in there and, and I do have one. Uh, and what you do is you put this in the bottom of the pie storm, okay? Not up here where you'd think you would. Flip it over, put it in the bottom, and then this little guy acts as a heat sink. This rubber pad that comes with it has to go on top of the GPIO, GPIO pins here. That's gonna keep the keyboard from shorting out. So 
when you put this on here, line up your little GPIO pins, push it right down. Now there are screws that go right here along with these little plastic bumpers. There are one, two, three different screw holes that you're supposed to screw down. Some of them are, I believe, underneath here. Why do I only have two of these little rubber spacers? Yeah, because I dropped one on the floor and now I can't find it. Why am I not using the little rubber spacers and screws on mine? Well, because I take this thing apart and put it together 52 different times during testing. So, you know, I don't want to have to keep taking it apart. When you put yours in permanently, do yourself a favor, use the little plastic spacers and tighten it down. It spaces everything out properly for you. So this is it. This is the Pi Storm uh, light right here. And that's a nice Raspberry Pi. And you can see that's substantially smaller than a lot of other accelerators that are available for the Amiga 1200. For example, this is currently replacing my Blizzard 68040 with 64 megs of RAM. You can see there's quite a size difference here. This thing installs in about half a second in your Amiga 1200. This one takes me about three and a half weeks to plug in because it's so big and bulky. You have to squeeze it in and just barely tighten it. It's a pain in the butt, but it's a great accelerator. Let's go ahead and plug it in. Now you are certainly 100% able just to plug in the Raspberry Pi from the bottom by just taking off the trap door because this is so compact it just slides right in. I happen to already have my keyboard and everything off of here so I just thought I'd plug it in this way. So we can just uh, get it right under there and she just slots right in. Now of course with an Amiga 1200 it's often nice to move things out about half a millimeter. Now as is this is not going to do a single thing. This is not going to function at all because we have not done anything to get the Amiga OS prepared to work with a Raspberry Pi. That's what we're going to cover in today's video. One of the complaints I had about the Raspberry Pi in my initial video uh, a year or so ago is that you literally had to fight with three different computers and three different operating systems to get it to work. You had to first set things up on your uh, PC or your Mac and get your card all configured and copy some files over to your card. Then you had to uh, boot up the actual Raspberry Pi itself and have uh, like a keyboard and mouse connected to it and, and download some things to it uh, through the Linux on the Raspberry Pi and download some files and do some updates. And it was a it was a hassle to be perfectly honest. Then you had to go in the Amiga and load some stuff there. So we're talking three different operating systems to configure your Raspberry Pi. Was it hard? Not really, it's just kind of a pain. You come, sometimes you just want to plug and go. Now, that's where this MU68K is so delightful because it eliminates the most difficult part, which is fighting with Linux. And remember your sudo and your commands and your blah, boring. What we need the PC for is to initially format and set up an SD card and get it prepared to work in your Amiga. Super de duper simple. And we're going to go over that here in just a second. Then we just plug it into the Amiga. In theory, the Amiga will recognize everything and we can either install an operating system like we used to do from floppy disk or from a GoTech or do the method that I'm going to show you, which is copying your existing hard drive from your Amiga 1200 right onto the Pi Storm, where it's going to run faster. So, what do we need for this? We need an SD card. And what we need is an itsy bitsy tiny little SD card. Any size is fine. You're going to want, um, you know, a gig minimum. You could even get away with 512 megabytes, but that's boring because we're going to use a newer version of the Amiga OS that's going to support large drives. So in this case, this particular drive is a 64 gig SD card. I'm going to put it in my interface. We're going to hook it up to my PC and I'm going to show you how to set this little guy up. 
follow me. Now we're going to be using Windows to do all of our work here. Can you do this in a Mac? Yeah, you could. You could. There's there's ways to do it on the Mac. But we're going to use Windows. This will work in Windows 10 or Windows 11. First of all, you want to launch a command prompt, but you want to launch it with administrative rights because we're going to need full admin rights for this this system that we're going to run. So run as administrator. Now we're going to launch the program disk part. This is the disk partition utility. This is a dangerous utility to run. Uh, and the reason that it's a dangerous utility is because you could format and erase your onboard hard drive and it's barely going to warn you at all. Now you look here, disk zero is my 256 gigabyte onboard hard drive on here. I don't want to mess with that and it is going to default to disk zero. That's the one we're working with right now. We want to work with disk five on my machine because it's my 64 gig SD card. Why is it only say 58 gig? Because hard drive manufacturers lie to your face about the capacity of the drives. That is a fact of life. We're going to select disk five. Okay. Disk 5 is now the selected disk. If you get a message besides that, you know, disk X is now the selected disk, and that disk being your SD card, don't proceed because you could erase your hard drive, and that would be bad, and that's not my problem. First command we want to do is just make sure it's wiped out. We're going to run the clean command. Okay, access is denied. Let's see what we need to do about that. Somehow it did not detect that I had launched it as administrator. I launched it again as administrator, selected the right disk, and the, the cleaning was successful. No problem at all. Now, we need to create some partitions. First partition we're going to create is just a small 200 megabyte partition because that's going to contain the actual PyStorm code, and that's only 20, 30 megabytes. So a 200 meg partition is plenty. CRE, PART, PRI size equals 200. Whoops. It's now created a 200 megabyte partition. Now, we are going to partition the rest of this 64 gig drive. And there's two ways to think about it. One way is we could use the entire capacity of the drive and then partition it into a workbench and a work and a data partition using Amiga OS, or we can create individual virtual hard drives that the Amiga actually thinks are separate hard drives for each partition. Either way works fine. For laughs, we're going to create one Amiga partition that is one gigabyte in size, and we're going to use that for Workbench. So we're going to create part PRI size equals 1024 for a gigabyte. This next part's important, ID equals 76. That lets the system know that it is a different kind of partition, not just a generic like FAT32, okay? Oh, look what I did. Instead of the equal sign, I put the minus sign. There we go. Yay! Now we have a one gigabyte partition on here. Now, you could continue to create additional partitions. Like if we wanted to create uh, the next partition to be eight gigs, you could do, you know, 8,096 right here. Then we'd have a second partition that's eight gigs in size. Or we could do this, just like this. That will create the rest of the partition, the rest of the space on the SD card as one big partition that then we could subdivide using a hard disk toolbox on the Amiga into sub partitions if we wanted to, but it's going to see it as one big disk. So we're going to do that just for laughs. Okay. Now what we've done is we've created a three different partitions. We're going to select partition one. Okay. Now what we could do, we could do list partition. I think that's right. And it's going to show you the partitions that we have. 200 megabyte partition, 1024 megabyte partition, 56 gigabyte partition. Okay. Absolutely beautiful. It's showing our partitions. Notice that Partition 3 is the one that's selected because it's got a big old asterisk here. 
we're going to do a command select partition 1. Now we can go back and take a look and it's see it's changed the default the primary the, the, the partition that we're doing to partition 1. We're going to type the word assign successfully assigned the partition okay now we could do this if we wanted to right here but we're not going to cancel out of that now we can type exit and exit again don't type end CLI like I often do now we're gonna have some new partitions and only one of them is going to show up in Windows because the other two partitions we created are created with ID 76 they don't show up by default we want to format this and we're gonna format this as fat 32 bada bing bada boom we're gonna call this Amy boot just for laughs and a quick format is fine yippee now that we have a 200 megabyte partition, here's what you do next. You open up your web browser and you browse to the GitHub that has all of the MU68 code on it. I'll have that link in the description. Here it is right here and I should be putting it on the screen unless I forget. Now don't be a big dummy bird like me. What I did when I first tried mine the first couple of days, I just downloaded, oh, MU68 Pi Storm, boom, rock and roll. Okay, that's MU68 Pi Storm for the Amiga 500, the Amiga 600, and the Amiga 2000. Okay, Pi Storm 32 Lite, that's the one you want. And you see there's a couple of different versions. The latest one is uh, here, 310 right here. So you would download this. Let's see if it's the one I have. Yep, it's the one that I've already saved, so I won't resave it. Um, but I've got that 2023 310 one right here. So you would save yours. Then we're going to go to that folder. So you can see you'd have your PyStorm compressed file 2023 310. You decompress that, extract all, right click extract all and it's going to overwrite what I've already extracted there it should give me a message about overwriting it nope so now we have our extracted PyStorm stuff all of this that we just extracted is going to go onto the boot partition Amy boot that we just created so you can do control A to highlight all of them and then copy so in this case we'll do right click and then copy we're going to do our Amy boot see that down there Amy boot right click paste bang bang boom we've just put all of the Pi storm code in that 200 megabyte partition happy days all right are we done with this partition no you have to now put your own kickstart on this partition. All right, let me show you where I keep my kickstarts. I am going to use the kickstart from 3.2.2. You could use 3.1, you could use 3.14, use whichever kickstart you want to. I'm just going to use the latest one here. Here's update 3.2.2, ROMs, Amiga 1200, here it is, A1200.47.111.ROM. Okay, that's your ROM file there. Yours may have a different name. We're going to copy that right over and we're going to paste it into our Amy boot folder. Then we're going to rename it. Right click, rename. We're going to call this kick.rom. You can name it anything you want to, okay? But the reason we're calling it kick.rom is because this config file is going to point to that. So we're going to open up this config file. But what we're looking for is this line down here. init tram fs kick.rom. If you name your kickstart rom something different, change the name here. 
Okay, and then save this. We'll maybe play with these another time. And because in theory it's Linux, you know what? I'm going to make sure that it's the capitalization is exactly correct. Lowercase k kicked out wrong. Okay, we have now created our boot partition and we're ready to move this over to the Amiga and boot it up for the first time. So now what we've got is we have this little 64 gig card here with a 200 meg partition on it all set to boot into the Pi Storm. All right, I'm going to take out my card that I've already been playing with for a while and put that aside and then probably proceed to drop it on the floor and lose it forever and I'm going to put our new card in there. Now you'll notice I have an HDMI cable right here. That's because the Pi Storm supports really nice retargetable graphics that we're going to be talking about in a few minutes. First thing we're going to do is get Amiga OS loaded though. Uh, so let's start getting that set up right here. So you'll notice I do not have my Amiga hard drive plugged in here because we're going to ultimately be using the SD card as the hard drive. But I'm going to plug mine in. This is a IDE SATA drive. I'm going to plug mine in for the express purpose of copying the data over from here onto the SD drive so I don't have to completely reinstall everything. And this works actually pretty good. So let's go ahead and get this plugged in and we'll get the Amiga turned on and I'll show you what to do next. Now you'll notice that I've launched into my Amiga early startup control. I did this intentionally. Hold down both mouse buttons and you'll get to this uh, boot options. I'm doing this because I want to tell it, even though I have my hard drive in here, PDH0, I want to boot to my GoTech that has my Amiga OS 3.1 install disk on it. And you'll see why in a second. So I'm going to go ahead and choose that disk. I've chosen my, on my GoTech, my install disk, and I'm going to boot to that. Now you're going to notice something here. You're going to see my Workbench 1200 and my Work 1200. That is from my hard drive that I have plugged into my Amiga 1200 standard controller. I want to go to my install directory here on my floppy, my boot floppy. But instead of just installing, we want to go to HD Toolbox, and we want to tell HD Toolbox to look at the SCSI controller on the Pi Storm. So you click it, right click, go to Information, and here, where normally SCSI device is going to say SCSI.device, the name of the Pi Storm's SCSI controller is BRCM dash SDHC dot device. You're going to want to put that right in there and then you're going to click save. Now you're going to launch your HD toolbox. And in theory, what this will see is it will, instead of seeing your onboard SCSI, it will see these three devices, SCSI 0, SCSI 1, SCSI 2. All right. For the love of God, do not do anything with this SCSI address zero, loon zero. This is your 200 megabyte uh, partition on your Pi Storm that holds the Pi Storm boot stuff. If you change this, you're gonna have to start from scratch. We're gonna go here to SCSI one and SCSI two, change drive type, define new, and because of a bug in Amiga OS 3.1.4 and above, you're gonna to wanna to give this a different name because if you've already used this, the name drive definitions, it's not gonna let you save it again. Read configuration, Fison, okay, great. All right, now we have one of them set up. We're gonna to go to disk two, change drive type, define new, read configuration, Let's see if it's going to give me an error here. Nope, we're good. We're going to save the changes. Save the changes. Now we have two devices. Okay, we're going to partition these drives. You see it is a full one gig partition. That's the first one we created. So we're going to 
delete that and we're going to create a new partition here. We want to change this name. If we keep this as PDH0, it's going to conflict with the PDH0 that my original drives are already recognized as. So we're going to call this, uh, let's see, QDH0. Why not? We can call it anything we want to. And we're going to, uh, let's see, that's one gig. Let's go ahead and change the file system block size a little higher. And we're going to save this. Now we're going to go to our second drive. We're going to notice it's also mighty big. We're going to make the full capacity because we can. And we're going to call this QDH1. Uh, give it some more buffers. We got plenty of memory here. File system block size, because it's such a big drive, make it bigger. Now we have the memory where we don't absolutely have to do that, but this increases the performance. Now we have two new drives. Save changes, yay. We got the one gigabyte and we have about a 58 gigabyte. Now we're gonna go ahead and exit and we're going to reboot. We still want this to boot up into our install floppy because we want to format these drives. So I'm holding down the right mouse button, boot options. Again, I'm going to boot to DF1. But look here what we have, PDH0, PDH1. That's my onboard IDE, QDH0, QDH1. That is my new BRCM SDH-1.device. That's the ones on the PyStorm. But we're still booting to the install disk. So here we are, we've now rebooted, and this is still my original workbench disk that I have in here, but I've got these two new drives. We're going to format the first one, and we're gonna call it, we'll call it WB1200. I never put in a trash can. All right, now we're gonna format the second one, we're going to call this one work. We want to give it a, a little different name here, just so that the, the, it's easier to recognize. We can change that later. 56 gig capacity. All right, so now we have a nice 56, uh, almost 57 gig drive, and we have our workbench floppy, or workbench drive right here. What are we going to do now? We're going to go back to install. We're going to open up our shell. Watch what we do. Copy. Now, first, just so you know what, what drive letters are here. Whoops. IFO. We have PDH0, which is my regular workbench disk. PDH1, which is my regular uh, work file. And then we have QDH0 and QDH1. I'm going to copy PDH0 colon, okay, to QDH0 colon, clone all. Oh. It now goes through and it is copying everything from my onboard disk drive onto the PyStorm's drive that we just created. We're gonna let that go and reboot it when we're done. So now we've copied over the workbench partition uh, to the new drive on the SD card. We would do the same thing with the work partition. In this case, I do copy PDH1 colon space QDH1 colon space clone all and it would copy everything from my work partition over. Now honestly I've got like 25 gigs on that work partition and it would take about an hour and a half so I'm going to switch over to my card that I've already formatted and already moved everything over to and we're going to continue on with the information on the PyStorm.
So now that we've copied everything over to our little uh, flash drive on there, you can actually unplug your onboard IDE. You won't be needing it anymore. Um, now, can you run both the internal IDE and the Pi Storm simultaneously? Absolutely. Can you set up the Pi Storm to boot off your internal IDE and then use this as a huge hard drive for your work partition? No problem at all. There's no there's no worries at all. They they play nicely together. But we're going to unplug ours for now and we're going to boot directly up to the Pi Storm. Let's take a look. So you can see that she boots right up into my workbench. Okay, we our nice AGA screen here. This is a uh, high res interlaced uh, 32 color screen, fairly zippity doo dah day. And of course, we would be absolutely remiss if we didn't run the good old sysinfo, wouldn't we? Let's take a look at that. Okay, so here we are in a, a recent version of sysinfo. We're going to do a speed test, take a look at what we've got here. And it says it's 434 times faster than an Amiga 600 and 41 times faster than an Amiga 4000. Now, is any of this true? Well, sort of, yes, maybe, no, not really. Uh, what this is, is, is it's a raw test of the CPU power. And yes, it is fast. It is incredibly fast. And with many things, you'll get performance like this. With other things at Amiga, no, not so much. Let's take a look at the memory. 236 megabytes of memory. I think that's adjustable. I just haven't gotten around to doing it yet. There's 112 megabytes of memory. Nice. And 2 megs of chip RAM. Now, usually when I do the disk speed test, it will crash right here. But let's see if it does. Kaboom! And it crashes. How delightful. Now, to be perfectly honest, sysinfo often crashes in the hard disk tests when it's testing something a little bit non-standard. So I'm, I'm perfectly accepting of that. Now, you guys know I do a lot of stuff with like art department professional here, a lot of uh, photo editing. So let's bring up something pretty big here. We're going to bring up a, uh, a nice big JPEG file. That's what we're going to do. And here's a nice, we're going to see if it's any good. loading it up and it loads very quickly. This is a three megabyte file. This is definitely loading faster than it would on a uh, like a 68030 or even a 68040. This is a, a 2912 by 3381 size image we're going to scale it down and see how quick scaling works with this new little guy right here. Let's scale it to half the size and then we're going to half the size again just for laughs. So we're going to scale it down to half the size. Look how fast it scales. That is absolutely much faster than my 684, 68040 does. We're going to bring it down again, 728 by 845. Boom. All right. Now let's render it and let's do something fun like uh, Oh, 800 by 600 here. There we go. In full ham eight glory. And we're going to see what kind of picture it is. I don't even know what this one is. Oh, look at that. It's my wedding day. How sweet. Isn't that a nice one to pick, Douglas? So you can see that it actually generates the images very, very, very quickly. And it does a really nice job. The other awesome thing about what I do with this is JPEG images are memory hogs when they're decompressed on the Amiga. And with over 300 megabytes of memory available, I don't have any issues loading anything. Let's take a look at another program. Let's look at image effects. We'll load this up in a nice, uh, let's do an 1280 by 1024 in 256 colors. Sorry, this is 1280 by 720. Now, see how that's redrawing the screen like that? See how slow that is? We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Oh, look. Eventually, someday, 
it will get there. Okay, that's in 1280 by 720, which is a resolution the Amiga supports just fine. You'll just never find a monitor that supports it unless you get something like an Indivision MK2 or Indivision MK3. Okay, see how slow that is? Let's redraw the screen and take four hours to do it. But once we actually get in here, let's see, we're going to open up the same picture. That loads up the JPEG image fairly quickly. Da, 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 da. There we go. Look at that happy couple. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to resize it. Uh, this time we're just going to go in and do scale and we're going to make an actual image size here. Size preset. And this is going to screw up the aspect ratio totally, but that's okay. We're going to go PAL high res over scan. Now look how fast that scales the image. This would normally take 45 seconds to a minute on my 68040 easily. That's done in seconds because the CPU is so blazingly fast here. Now we're going to go ahead and render it. And I'll choose a different resolution. That's what we want. We want PAL. And HAM 8 renders it quite quickly. I said renders it quite quickly. <laughs> There's the happy couple. And again, it butchers the aspect ratio, but we're just doing this as a as a little test here. And we will watch as we move things around and watch it slowly repaint the screen. Now, let's talk about what's going on here. So what did we just see right there? First of all, we saw how easy it was to get your PyStorm set up to boot your Amiga. We saw in SysInfo how incredibly fast the CPU is and how beautiful the screen is. This is These are just AGA screens right now. Then we launched our art department professional. We saw how unbelievably fast that was. That was so much faster than my 68040. It's, it's truly noticeable. Just rescaling that image, like I said, might take a minute, maybe even a minute and a half to watch it rescale here seconds done boom just like that displays the images just beautifully but then we launched image effects and we went into a mode where honestly 90 percent of you are never going to go into but the amiga supports beautifully 1280 by 720 in 256 colors believe it or not amiga supports it fine it's just you have to have like a indivision mk3 or mk2 to display it on a modern monitor or you need a really wacky multi-sync monitor that'll sync like 17 kilohertz and 22 kilohertz, 25 kilohertz, then displays fine. Amiga's always been able to support it. But I did that intentionally to show you something interesting. Many of you have heard that chip RAM access on the Pi Storms is slower than a native Amiga. And it's true, it just is. Whether it's ECS chipset or AGA, it can't pull the data back and forth fast enough and so access to chip ram is slower and what we're seeing from what from what i can tell what we're seeing is the result of that when we deal with high color screens you're going to see this even at 640 by 480 in 256 colors and uh, i'm working on a second video where we're going to do some comparisons and and see just uh just, just where it is, but uh, Kevin Quattro and I from uh, Holden Modified did a couple of tests playing back some uh, 
uh, AGA videos and uh, seeing the difference in speed between like a 68040 and a 68060 in the Pi Storm. And the results that we're seeing are when you use higher color, especially HAM8 on a Pi Storm, it's going to be slower than if you were running on a, honestly, almost slower than running it on a 68020 with a lot of memory. Um, but it's certainly a lot slower than a 68040. Those screen redraws we saw right there where image effects was, was refreshing the screen one little panel at a time. Yeah. 1280 by 720, 256 color, even on a 68060 is not blazingly fast. It is noticeably slow but it's two to three times faster than what we are seeing on there, even on my 68040. And we're gonna do a follow-up video just to show the, the performance difference. Now, does this make it bad? Absolutely not. They've been enhancing this the entire time and it's getting better all the time. And I've been in touch with the developers and they have a theory about why that's happening. But I need to let you know it does happen. If you're planning on getting this and doing because you want to do big AGA animations and things like that, this isn't the right product. Get yourself a 68060. You will have better performance with high color AGA modes. If you're doing what I'm doing, editing photographs, uh, even high color photographs, because I don't need the redraw to be fast. I just need to be able to see the image. Unbelievably fast, incredibly fast. Now, there's something we can do to improve things and make this blazingly fast, even in high color modes, and that is activate retargetable graphics on the machine. This supports retargetable graphics beautifully. Now let's talk about how we do that. You're gonna need two different things to get RTG graphics working on your PyStorm, and it's so incredibly easy. Now, I put this on my compact flash card. This is just a 64 megabyte compact flash card. I use it for a little basic data transfer. I downloaded both of these on my PC and I copied them right over. Picasso 96. Our friend Jens from Individual Computers still sells a brand new copy of this. You can pick it up for like seven bucks and it's a nice updated copy or the free version that's still on AmyNet still works fine. I'll have links to both in the description. And then you need this file, emu68-vc4. This is something that's available from a link. It's a Google Drive link that I will put in the description, okay? First of all, let's go ahead and install Picasso 96. We're gonna go through and install of it. So let's... Uh, Copy that over to my downloads, and we're going to decompress Picasso 96. LHA E. I couldn't tell you how many times I've forgotten to put the E in there. Now when it's done, let's go ahead and launch the installer. Picasso 96 install, setup, okay. We're going to go through, we're going to do, uh, we're going to say it's a first install, just so we can pretend like uh, we're doing it uh, from scratch. Intermediate user. Now here, where it asks you, um, uh, da -da -da -do -da -do -da -do. we don't want to read, you can choose literally any of these video cards here, because we're just going to change the name of it. We're just going to install it, pretending we have a Picasso 4 card. And in a minute, we're going to change the name. And accept the defaults there. Yes, 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 yes. All the defaults. And it's now installing Picasso 96. Again, accepting all the defaults and just telling it that I'm using uh, a, a that specific video card. And we don't need to reboot quite yet. Second thing is we want to find the second bit of uh, code that we have right there. That's the dot card file. What we want to do with this is we want to put this in the libs folder. Now you can use directory opus. You can do it from a command prompt or uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go to the workbench 
unhide all the folders. We're going to look at libs. Inside of the libs folder here, you see this one called Picasso 96. This is where all the different drivers for the different network or video cards go. We're just going to copy mu68-vc4.card into libs Picasso 96. And again, copy that over any way that you want to. Then you're going to go into your workbench again. We're going to take a look at devs. We're going to take a look at monitors. And you're going to see that there's this Picasso 4 monitor that exists right here. And we're not using a Picasso 4. So we're going to click it. We're going to go to information, icon, uh, board type Picasso 4. Guess what we're going to change that to? We're going to change that to we changed that to the EMU68-VC4. Now notice we don't have to put card on the end of it, and that's okay. So we're just telling it which of those uh, files to look at. We're going to save that, and then we can rename this if we want to. Right now it's labeled Picasso 4, but we know it's not a Picasso 4. We're going to go ahead and rename that to Pi RTG. Now we're going to reboot and carry on with setting up the retargetable graphics. So when we reboot we need to set up RTG graphics modes. These are not preset. Go into prefs, go into Picasso 96 mode. You notice it says it can't find any modes. That's fine. We're going to go ahead and this icon here, we're going to drag this down right to here and we're going to give it a name. We're going to call this Pi RTG. Now, we should get a message here. Um, once we attach it to the board, there. A mode which is not suitable for this board has been found. No board, 320 by 200, blah, blah, blah. We want to erase all the modes that are not compatible, and we're going to create our own. So we're, we've now deleted all of those modes that are not compatible. What we have is a 640 by 400 mode and a 640 by 480 mode. Let's take a look and see if those actually work. We're going to do true color, 640 by 480. We're going to do test. Now I switch my input over to my PyStorm's input, and beautiful, 640 by 480, 24-bit. But we do not just want silly little 640 by 480 modes. We want additional modes. How do we get our 800 by 600 and 1280 by 720? Now pay close attention, because this is not necessarily clear, okay? This little symbol here, new item, drag it down. 640 by 480, active. Change this. 800 by 600, okay. That's a nice mode. Perfect. Now, this is still highlighted. Drag this, new item, over to here. 256 color, chunky, 256 color. Let's test it. Test. I'm switching my switch box, 800 by 600, 8 bit color. We're going to do that for every mode we want. You do this one time and everything's saved. Drag a, a new mode over, this time, high color mode, perfect. Drag it over here. You want to save it? Yes. True color mode, perfect. We're going to drag another one over. Yes, true color and alpha, beautiful. We've now created 800 by 600 modes right here. Okay, now we're gonna do it again. Drag this down. Let's say you wanna keep the aspect ratio good. So 1024 by 768. All right. We've now created a new, a new mode, 1024 by 768. Drag this here, chunky mode, 1024 by 6, 768. Is it gonna work? 
yes, it works absolutely beautifully. I'm going to switch back. Do the same thing. Drag it over. High color. Drag it over. Save. True color. Drag it over. Save. True color and alpha. Perfect. Okay. Now we've got 640 by 480, 800 by 600, 1024 by 768. Let's do a nice uh, wide format mode. I like 1280 by 720. Nice high def, but still not a horrible struggle. Drag it over here. 256 color. Drag another one. High color. Drag another one true color. Drag another one. True alpha. Okay. Not that difficult. Let's just make sure it works. We're going to look at this uh, true color mode here. 1280 by 720, 24-bit color. Guys, this is not rocket science. It's really not that hard to do. Okay. Now we're going to save these. and we're going to reboot and we're going to see how our new modes work. Now you'll notice we're still in 640 by 400 in AGA modes. We're going to go to prefs. We're going to go to screen mode and look what's appeared here. All of these MU68K modes. 1024 by 768, 1280 by 720. Let's look at that mode. Full 24-bit color click use and I'm going to switch my switch box because it's got a switch between uh, the Pi Storm and look what we have here we have a 24-bit workbench beautifully fast incredibly fast as a matter of fact you know I'm gonna bring this down to a 16-bit because for some reason it changes the color of workbench at 24-bit in a way I don't like. I like this better. Yeah, that looks better. That's still a 16-bit workbench. Look how fast that is. That is blazingly flipping fast. Full retargetable graphics on your Amiga. We're going to launch Ad Pro. We're going to bring up our picture again because I'm so unbelievably good looking. Okay. Let's go ahead and scale this down to 1280 by 720. That's going to really screw up the aspect ratio because that's not the aspect ratio we have here. But again, we're just having fun. Now we're going to see if we can render this in a Picasso mode here. Maybe 1280 by 720, 16 million colors. Let's see what happens. absolutely nothing does not like the ad pro Picasso saver that's fine okay we've reloaded the image we've rescaled it this time we're going to use one of the other renderers we're going to use the 8-bit 1280 by 720 we're going to see how she looks execute <laughs> see how fast that is much faster than AGA graphics and it still looks absolutely fantastic absolutely beautiful now can you still use all of the AGA modes on here? Absolutely. So what have we learned here today? Well, we've learned that Doug looks absolutely fantastic in a suit on his wedding day. <laughs> oh, I guess my wife looked pretty good too, but yeah, Doug looked really good on his wedding day. We learned that retargetable graphics on a Pi Storm is not that hard to do. Just follow the steps and you just have to follow them once and Boom, you've got modes 800 by 600, 1024 by 68, 1280 by 1024, 1280 by 720. Now, I haven't tried like the, the full high def, like 1920 by 1080. I honestly haven't tried it. It might work. I don't know. We should probably try it. But it's easy to set up. We also learned that Workbench in 24-bit mode looks a little strange. It, it changes the colors in it, on, on mine, and I don't know why, but going into 16-bit mode, which is 65,000 colors, looks perfect. We find that rendering 
with a program like Art Department Professional to those high color modes, works great. I've also done it in image effects, works fantastic. Now, can other programs load up on retargetable graphics? Absolutely. A program like New Mode or Mode Pro, they work great. They take standard Amiga programs and they launch right in retargetable graphics windows. For example, if you look over my shoulder here, let's go to ProWrite. We're going to launch ProWrite. Now, normally ProWrite's going to launch right on a standard Amiga screen is a test, but we can use a program like Mode Pro or New Mode to tell it to launch into retargetable graphics. Now watch what happens now that I have new mode up on this uh, configured on here. When we launch ProWrite, new mode asks us if we want to promote the screen. Sure, we want to use ProWrite in 1024 by 768 in 16-bit color. So I just choose that, choose that. I'm going to tell it just to use it this time and not save it. 1024 by 768 in 16-bit color. ProWrite is now incredibly small and hard to read but you get the point a lot of amiga programs will work fine in retargetable graphics some paint programs like uh, personal paint which i've done a review on right there also work okay with retargetable graphics you see this is launched into uh, a standard amiga aga graphics mode but i can tell it to go into any mode that i want to we're going to go to image format. Uh, we're going to go to a nice 800 by 600 mode here. 800 by 600, 8 bit. In theory, it should now open up on an 800 by 600 RTG screen. Works fine. No, the monitor's not crooked. That's just the angle I'm at. But it works okay. Pretty cool, huh? So, what did we learn today? Pi Storm easy to purchase from a, a trusted vendor like Amiga Kit. Getting an actual Raspberry Pi, a little more difficult, but get, put yourself on a waiting list, you can get one. Get a 3A plus if you can get it because they're nice and small. Nice and small. Uh, getting a Pi 3B works too, although they're bigger, it's a tighter fit, but it does work. The Pi Raspberry Pi 4, there's a new version of MU68K that does work with the Pi 4. It's incredibly fast. A little bit buggier, I'd wait a little while and, and make sure they get all the little kinks worked out. If you're doing processor intense things, let's say you're rendering Lightwave 3D images, oh my goodness, this thing is an absolute miracle. If you're like me, you're using image effects, you're using an art department professional or some other big graphics program, whether it uses retargetable graphics or not, the speed boost is phenomenal. Hard drive access is incredibly fast using the virtualized hard drive and the SD card. Retargetable graphics, pretty good. Not perfect, but pretty good. What I find is sometimes when I switch to retargetable graphics mode with programs, they'll get stuck. You go to exit out of it, it doesn't exit out and you're stuck and you have to reboot. Um, there's some kinks that need to be worked out with the retargetable graphics mode, but it mostly works and it is fantastic for the price. When you go to use full AGA screens with full AGA performance, HAM 8, uh, 256 color, the Pi Storm is slower than a lot of other accelerators. Probably won't always be slower, but today with the downloads you can get, it's slower. It just is a lot slower. Like I said, I'm going to do a video with some comparisons from 68040 running at 40 megahertz and the Pi Storm. The Pi Storm is going to eat its lunch when it comes to processor intensive tasks. The 68040 is going to be the big winner when it comes to manipulating AGA screens. It's just a fact of life right now. How does the Pi Storm work with games? You guys know I'm not a huge gamer, but I love games, and I use my Amiga 1200 as my main gaming system. Well, that is a good question. It works pretty well with games. I find 50-60% of WHD load games I try just work right off the bat. The other 40%, 
you have to tweak it. There's some cache settings you have to do, and I'm going to put some links in the description for both the Discord server and the Facebook page where they talk about some of the, the, the cache settings you have to do to get the games to work. But don't expect to go from a 68030 50 megahertz accelerator in your Amiga 1200 to putting a Pi Storm in there and going, wow, all my games are working so much better. They're fantastic. You're going to go, huh, why do half my games suddenly not work unless I go in and tweak this and change that and alter this and reconfigure that? And is that really what you want to do? You don't need a CPU this fast to play video games. What you need is fast access to the AGA chipset, which the Pi Storm doesn't do. So it's not really something I'd recommend if you're using it for gaming. Stick to a regular accelerator for gaming. If you're doing the kind of stuff I do, Pi Storm all the way. It's fantastic. Huge thanks to my wonderful, fantastic patrons. Love you guys. You can see them scrolling over this uh, this this beautiful image of a of a couple deeply in love getting married almost five years ago. Uh, boy, what a handsome couple they are and modest, incredibly modest. But if you'd like to join in that Patreon fun, pop on over to my Patreon site and sign up. Thanks for joining me today. Please like and subscribe. Follow me on all the social media channels. Uh, please comment below and rip me a new one telling me how wrong I am about the performance on the Pi Storm and that actually it's like God's gift to Amigas. Guys, vampires work better than a Pi Storm. Fact of life. Guys, 68060 accelerators in many ways work better than a Pi Storm. What the Pi Storm has is price, you know, less than a hundred bucks. Man, you've gotten in retargetable graphics, fast hard drive, you know, yeah, absolutely. But don't let them fool you when they say, oh, this is a vampire killer. Oh, this is a, a 68060 killer. It's not necessarily, it's different. It has different strengths. But please rip me apart in the comments below about it. I love it. But until next time, this is Doug from 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast signing out to go lose 15 pounds so I can fit back in that darn suit again.